Hey guys, how's it going? I'm back here with another video and today I decided to bring this video where I'm going to be going over some really cool tips that you can use to actually increase the performance of your React.js applications. Before we get into the video, if you could leave a like and subscribe, I would massively appreciate it. It would help push my videos to more people and it would just help me with my content. So yeah, that's basically it. With that in mind, let's get into the video. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is the use of the hook use ref to increase performance. So a lot of you guys might think this is a weird thing to include in this video because many of you guys actually misunderstand one of the main purposes of the use ref hook. Um, a lot of tutorials out there, including tutorials I've made in the past, uh, stress the fact that the use ref hook is used to be able to grab and edit elements from the DOM as if you were using, for example, uh, document get element by ID or a query selector in normal JavaScript. Uh, but the thing is, that's not its only purpose. For that reason, I see a lot of people not actually using the use ref um, a lot because when do you actually need to edit, like, like directly edit an element from the DOM? Uh, it's for rare occasions, such as, for example, focusing on an input or grabbing the value or something like that, right? And I see a lot of people just neglecting this hook and not using it as much as it should be used. However, one of the main use cases of the hook that I see people overlooking it a lot is the fact that the use ref hook allows you to store a mutable value that persists across re-renders. This is really useful because there's a lot of situations where you can actually decrease the amount of times a component re-renders by using the use ref hook. In the screen right now, I'm actually just showing you guys a very like simple but clear example of how this can exist. Um, you guys are seeing the code right now and uh, this is an example of how, for example, you can grab the value of an input and um, set it to be a state, right? So for example, if you wanna grab that value of a specific input and do something with that value, such as in this case, you're gonna, you're just gonna click on the button and alert whatever you wrote on the, on the input. Um, it's normal for people, including myself in a lot of my videos, to just create a, a state and store the value of that input into that state, right? However, uh, since we only really, in this case, need the value from the input when the button is clicked, it's not automatic. We don't need it while we're typing on the input, right? We just need the final value of what the user typed on the input when you click on the button. In this case, it is necessary to actually use a state because it will re-render the component every time the value of that state changes, right? So we use this use effect in this example, which console logs the word re-render every time the component is re-rendering. So you're seeing right now that what's happening is every single letter I type will actually increase the re-render, like will re-render the component once more, uh, which is again, unnecessary. Uh, what we can actually do to fix this is uh, create, actually instead of using a state, we use a ref to keep track of the value of the input. With a ref, you can just create, a, for example, a, a constant called the input ref, set it as the reference to the input. You don't even have to put an on change method or anything like that. And then when you click on the button, you just grab the current value of that reference. So with that, um, we won't be actually re-rendering the component every time there's a change to the input because we'll only grab the value of the input when it is done. So this is a really cool use case. We kind of decrease the amount of re-renders of this component from technically an infinite amount because you can just keep typing on the input for forever and it will keep re-rendering the component. Uh, we decrease from an infinite amount to actually just one because it will only re-render once uh, when you click on the button. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So does that mean that whenever you have an input, you should always use the use ref instead of creating a state? No, absolutely not. Because there's use cases where you need a state uh, also, minor re-renders like this one uh, are not that big. Uh, dep it depends on the size of your project and depends on how many users are going to be using it. However, it's just a tip to increase performance because it will indeed decrease the amount of re-renders. So keep that in mind whenever you're building your next project. Okay, so the second thing I really want to talk about is um, how to properly download dependencies. So I, I see a lot of developers being very extreme with how they deal with dependencies. So it can be either from one side where I see developers not downloading any dependencies, try to build their project from scratch, uh, not using component libraries, not using CSS libraries, just trying to do everything from scratch, which in my opinion is dumb because the reason why we, we got to where we are in the web development community is because we use work from other people to be able to um, allow us to write code faster. So we keep building upon what has been built before to 
progress with our career or progress with uh, programming in general. So whenever you don't want to use uh, a library that is just going to make your life so much easier, it's kind of like uh, you're not actually taking advantage of all the tools that are provided to you. So I don't think that's a good approach. But on the other hand, I see especially beginners when they find out that the amount of libraries and, and dependencies that exist out there is that they just download almost um, like any dependency they see, they download for any use case. For example, oh, they need a carousel or they need a, a modal for their project. Well, I'll, let me just download Material UI <laughs> with like a bunch of different stuff, a super heavy library uh, and just use for that specific use case. And that's also not a good idea in my opinion. You've probably done this where you need, I don't know, specific, like a small thing from a library, may it be a function, may it be a hook, may it be a component from Material UI, for example. And you just need that one thing. So what you do is that you download the entire library, you add it to your dependency list, you add that that's that thing into your bundle. And um, it, it at the end of the day, it works, but uh, now you just increase the bundle size of your application, uh, unnecessarily, uh, and depend and that builds up, like that continues increasing, increasing as you progress through the web app, because you're going to run into new situations where you need to download new dependencies. So this is what I would do to avoid uh, unnecessarily doing this kind of stuff. First of all, I would install a uh, extension that I think is, um, it's almost like a state, like it's, it's, it's a standard extension in the market nowadays. It's called import cost. I, I have it in almost all of my videos. A lot of people asked about it. It's really famous. Uh, it does nothing more than just telling you exactly uh, the size of what you're importing whenever you import a package uh, in VS code. Uh, it's really cool because it really gives you a perspective. Um, obviously, you could just see the cost and uh, the size of your packages before. But I know how we are as developers, we we don't think as much as we like to think we <laughs> we think before doing stuff. So um, I think this packet or this this depend this extension is really cool to have inside of VS Code. Not only this, but carefully choosing your dependencies and packages, uh, always outweighing the benefit of the functions and methods and components you're getting from that specific package with uh, the cost of its size and also. Uh, other stuff, for example, the package can become outdated, and then you have to replace everything, right? <laughs> you have to rewrite the code because it's not going to be maintained. Uh, that kind of stuff, you really need to compare and contrast, like see different packages, not just get the most popular one, and um, really understand what you're putting. Because think about it this way, you're injecting code into your project. So you're kind of responsible for anything that happens from that code to the users that are using your project. So keep in mind, it's like basic ethics of programming. So um, it's important that you always keep that in mind. And if you do that, I can guarantee that your projects will start uh, becoming faster because you're thinking about the size of it while you're developing it. Okay, so the third thing I want to talk about, it's really small, but it's it's something that is really cool because it affects a lot of developers. And I think a lot of you guys might know this or already do this. However, I wanted to emphasize just because it is something that will affect a lot of you guys, which is virtualizing your lists. So in React, and in any web development project out there, it's very common to have some sort of list being displayed inside of your your app, right? Especially in web apps where uh, millions and millions of users out there are using it, those lists can become really large. And um, it is necessary that you make your app be scalable, depending on how big that list is. An example of it, it would be like displaying, I don't know, like all the posts on Instagram, right? They don't display everything at once, that would be stupid. <laughs> like it would take years to load everything that has been posted. And while it's loading, there would be more stuff being added to the list as well. So they progressively load everything, right? They, they, they show the posts and keep keep fetching more and more as you scroll through your app. Therefore, uh, this whole concept of virtualizing a list, which is basically just rendering a list into chunks so that you don't have to render it all at once is really important. And there's different libraries out there that can actually help you with this. Now, if I'm talking about fetching data, um, and you're getting the data from an API or something like that, you could just use uh, different methods of like progressively fetching more data. I've made a video on this on how to do this with GraphQL, for example, uh, if you're doing this with um, just a normal REST API, you can constantly be fetching and there's different methods out there that you can do this. Uh, but there's also libraries specifically in React, which you can do 
to render your lists in chunks. An example, and the most famous one, and the one that I would recommend the most is React Virtualized. It's really famous. Uh, I can leave a link for it in the description if you want to check it out, uh, read the documentation. I can even make a tutorial on it if you guys want, but this is definitely something you guys should keep in mind while building your apps. Now, the final thing I really want to talk about is actually probably one of the most important ones, in my opinion, which is knowing how to use and using the React Profiler. So React has what is known as the Profiler API, which basically measures uh, how like how many times an app or your app or your components are re-rendering, and what is the cost of those re-renders. And you can use that information to your advantage because I've seen that a lot of the issues with uh, performance in React doesn't come from organizing and structuring your code uh, prior to writing it in a way such that you think it is performant, but rather um, when you build your code you go and analyze what's happening in your app and then make the changes necessary. So my methodology for improving performance in a React app is not what you guys might think. I don't just follow every single best practice, not even some of the ones I'm talking in this video on every app I built. You don't build a performant app by micro analyzing every piece of code you write because it would probably just take a very long time. And um, some changes are not, are not gonna be that necessary on the long run. Um, when you also compare the cost of the time you're building your app um, to how many users are going to be affected by that and in which situation the users will be affected by that. So like all the tips I gave you guys in this video are good and they will solve specific use cases when you're having performance issues. But sometimes they will be like those changes will be negligible if you don't have the issues that are being caused by those problems. So what I mean by that is I build more performant websites in React by searching problems in my app and then fixing it, not by starting out trying to prevent the problems from happening. So if a component is re-rendering many times, making the app become slow, I will go ahead, find that problem and fix it uh, rather than already knowing the problem was gonna exist in, in, like beforehand because sometimes you just don't, right? And one of the main ways I do this and I search for problems and I find them is by using, for example, the React DevTools. Um, you can download it on your Chrome extension. Uh, it's a, it is a Chrome extension. You can download it inside, inside of your browser. Uh, and it allows you to really, really analyze how your components are are existing. It also because you're using um, the Dev Tools from your specific browser, at least in Chrome, you can actually uh, change how your website is being displayed. Um, maybe change it because when we are developers, we usually create our websites in really good like CPUs, really good internet connections. So it's hard for us to really understand how a user in a place where they don't have a really good computer or a really good internet is gonna be like experiencing our website. We really don't get that idea. Just because uh, a list with 2 million entries are rendering in 10 seconds for us, it doesn't mean that's gonna happen with most of our users. So we always have to um, test out with different internet connections, different, um, uh, I don't know, different computer systems. Uh, and we can actually do that and simulate that by using uh, your Chrome, your own browser DevTools. I can make a whole video on explaining how to properly um, analyze your, your performance in your website with the React DevTools. I think that would actually be really cool to do. Uh, let me know if you guys wanna do see that in the description. But I just wanted to mention to you guys that this is definitely the methodology I would approach whenever building apps. I know for a fact this is the methodology that a lot of big companies use because they don't really wanna be wasting time writing the perfect code because that's not what senior engineers are doing. Uh, they're more meant to find problems and fix it, like I mentioned it. So um, that's basically it for using React DevTools. And this is also basically it for this video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below and comment what you wanna see next. Subscribe, because I'm back this year. I just said it in my last video. Uh, I know at the end of last year, I was kind of slowing down a little bit, but it's just because of a lot of stuff that was happening with me in my personal life. Now, uh, I'm changing it. Uh, I'm coming back stronger than ever. Last year, we hit 100K. This year, my hopes is to just become more connected with my community and grow as much as I can. I'm hoping at least 200K, that would be awesome. <laughs> but uh, I can't thank you guys enough for everything you guys have done for me, all the support. And yeah, I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, leave a like down below and comment what you wanna see next. And yeah, that's basically it. Really hope you guys enjoyed it and I see you guys next time. <laughs>